Welcome everyone to our Let's Talk session today. Our session is about Philadelphia, Nebraska, and Louisiana and taxes, soda taxes and tax credits. I'm Debbie Mathias from the BUILD Initiative and the director of the QRIS National Learning Network. Before we begin our session together, I'd like to thank the Alliance for Early Success and other generous funders for making this learning community possible. We began this series for state quality administrators and leaders to support their important work within states around early learning systems building. Quality administrators are welcome to invite other participants as related to the specific topic of the call. We know several of you invited colleagues interested in policy, financing, and other cross-sector partners such as Head Start, Education, and Early Intervention. We have colleagues on the call from over 30 states and territories. We intentionally keep these sessions small to invite conversation and sharing. We hope the calls enable us to illuminate challenges, innovation, and promising practices. After the session, a survey will pop up asking you for your suggestions, comments, or questions. We appreciate your input and ideas about this session and will follow up with resources as requested. Also, thinking ahead, let us know if you're working on a promising practice or facing a challenge in your state systems building. Send me an email and we can develop a Let's Talk discussion around the topic. Thank you for taking the time to answer the questions when you registered. Many of you provided thoughtful ideas and questions, and we reviewed the information, and it's informing the presentation. Make sure to keep track of your questions and examples during the session for our discussion near the end. Enter your thoughts and ideas throughout in the chat box so we can reference them. We had a great deal of interest in this topic. Many of us have been thinking about financing strategies for early childhood services and systems, and I look forward to hearing more, as I'm sure you are, from our knowledgeable panel. Without further ado, I'd like to turn this discussion over to Harriet Dichter, our moderator for the session. Hi, Harriet. Thank you, Debbie. Hi, everyone, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We have a really terrific topic this month, taking a look at financing strategies for early childhood that are connected to QRIS. We will examine two tax credit strategies, one in Nebraska, which is new, and one historic one in Louisiana, and we'll also hear about the Philadelphia so-called soda tax. Our goal for today is to share information on the financing strategy, the advocacy strategy, and the underlying program that the strategy is supporting. We have a set of questions we've developed and for which each of our speakers will be responding. If all goes well, we may even have time to have questions from you. So if you do have questions, I want to encourage you in putting them in the chat box. We have the pleasure of having four experts with us today, and I want to introduce them now. Sarah Ann Kachian is the Vice President of Education and Early Childhood Policy for the Holland Children's Movement and the Holland Children's Institute in Omaha, Nebraska. Sarah Ann's work for children has ranged from infant rooms to boardrooms, the courtroom, and Capitol Hill. Her work for more than the past decade has been predominantly focused on a wide array of state policy issues impacting children from inside the Nebraska Unicameral. She is a graduate of Creighton University and the University of Nebraska Law School. Mary Strasser is the acting director for the Philadelphia Pre-K Initiative. She retired from federal government as the director of AmeriCorps Volunteers in Service to America, a VISTA program, at the Corporation for National and Community Service. Prior to joining the Corporation for National and Community Services, Mary served as Vice President for Community Impact at United Way of Southeastern Pennsylvania, and she has worked extensively over the year on issues, including stints at Philadelphia Promise, Philadelphia One to One, Big Brothers Big Sisters, and as a Program Director for Girl Scouts of Greater Philadelphia. Louise Stoney specializes in early care and education finance and policy, and is co-founder of both Opportunities Exchange and the Alliance for Early Childhood Finance. She has worked with state and local governments, 
foundations, national policy organizations, early care and education providers, industry intermediaries, and child advocate groups in more than 40 states and cities. Many public and private organizations have sought Louise's expertise to not only craft new financing strategies and policy actions, but to also write issue briefs and articles on challenging topics. Louise was instrumental in crafting Louisiana's innovative school readiness tax credits. And our last speaker um, that I'm introducing is Marissa Waxman. Marissa Waxman is the first Deputy Revenue Commissioner concentrating on revenue policy, regulation, and programming, as well as communications and intergovernmental affairs for the City of Philadelphia. She holds a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and is a proud member of the 255th graduating class of Philadelphia Central High School, the nation's second oldest public high school founded in 1836. So as you can hear, we have a really interesting set of experts and activists who are joining us today for Let's Talk. Our discussion is about innovations in local and state financing, and it's a timely one. We know there's a renewed interest in tax credits. During the presidential campaign, both candidates had federal tax credit proposals for child care, and we've had some new local state-based financing that includes early childhood recently passed. So today, we selected a few locations to learn more about this. Philadelphia is going to share with us their first in the country big city win on a local soda tax, and it's used to support community pre-K. Nebraska had a stunning victory recently around tax credits, and Louisiana is what we're going to consider our grandmother for tax credits tied to QRIF. To get us started, I've asked each of our speakers to give us an overview of their tax strategy and the revenue that it is generating. So we're going to get going with Philadelphia. Thank you, hi. So this is Marissa Waxman from the City of Philadelphia's Department of Revenue and I wanted to tell you a bit about our Philadelphia beverage tax. Uh, this is a brand new tax for us starting January 1st of this year and it's a one and a half cent per ounce tax on the distribution of sweetened beverages. Uh, and so when we talk about sweetened beverages, it's actually much more than soda. Um, it's both sugar sweetened as well as diet drinks. It uh, includes everything from non-100% juices, uh, pre-sweetened iced teas and coffees, but there are a number of exclusions for things like baby formula, 100% juice, uh, medical foods. And this is a tax that will be funding both pre-K, community schools, and capital investments in our rec centers, libraries, and parks. Uh, the tax is on the distribution, so when it goes from the distributor to a retailer, uh, so it's not something that is paid by a store or a restaurant or by the end consumer, it's on the distribution. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about why that made sense for us. Um, but in addition to being one and a half cents per ounce on finished beverages, it's also a tax on any syrups or concentrates uh, used to create those finished beverages. So if you're thinking about fountain sodas and things like that. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, why a beverage tax and what makes a good tax. And starting from the basics, it has to raise enough money to make sure that we can do what we want to do. And we're trying to do that without really disrupting our economy and doing as little damage as possible. And a real great importance to us was the ease of administration. We wanted to make sure it was something that would be um, easy for taxpayers to comply with and easy for us to make sure that everyone was paying what they were supposed to pay on time. And that's part of the reason this tax is on distribution. That's a much smaller universe of folks. You know, it's your brand names, you know, the household Coca-Cola, Pepsi, folks like that that register, um, as opposed to us needing to go to every little, you know, restaurant, takeout store, corner store, convenience store. And so the reason we focused in on the Philadelphia beverage tax as the appropriate tax strategy for funding pre-K and the other items we mentioned is that it really met those criteria for us. It was going to generate sufficient funds. We had looked at some other options that simply wouldn't come up with enough money. Um, it also was going to do not nearly as much harm to our economy as other options. The city of Philadelphia for more than a decade has been trying to increase our economic competitiveness by reducing our relatively high business and income taxes. Um, and so we didn't want to put any additional uh, weight on that. Also, we've had recent real estate tax increases, so going back to our homeowners and other property owners wasn't an option again. 
And also, it was really important to us that, you know, folks could avoid this tax if they wanted to. Um, you know, unlike a property tax or a broad-based sales tax or an income tax, uh, Philadelphians can really avoid a beverage tax by simply making different choices about what they buy. And again, you know, that this really is on a small universe of taxpayers, which means that the implementation costs for um, getting this up and running are much lower than they would need to be if we were looking to collect this from a much broader group of folks. And just to give you a sense of scale, we have uh, only probably a couple hundred taxpayers for this. And so for the revenue estimates, we're expecting from this to get about $46 million in the first six months this fiscal year, and then uh, over the next couple of years get around $91 million a year for a total of $410 million over five years. Uh, it's only going to cost us about $1.8 million to implement it. Mary can tell you a little bit about how it will be spent. Right. So as Marissa said, the, the tax was – we just started uh, collecting the tax, so we're starting our uh, pre-K – it started just a couple of weeks ago, and in year, so we're ramping it up based on the ramp up of the revenue that we anticipate. So in year one, for example, we're starting off with 2,000 pre-K slots for the first six months at a cost of $23 million. In September, we'll add another 1,000 slots, so, so there'll be 3,000 in it, and that 3, 000, those 3,000 slots will cost us approximately $36 million. Um, again, in uh, 2019, which is the September of 2018, we'll be adding 1,000. So you can see as the revenue increases, our percentage of uh, the number of kids that are enrolled increases for um, uh, over a five-year period, getting to 6,500 uh, children, three- and four-year-olds participating in Philadelphia pre-K. So hi, everyone. This is Sarah Ann Cochin um, here in Nebraska, and I'd like to begin by thanking Bill for the opportunity to share our recent success here in Nebraska with our school readiness tax credits. So in 2016, the Nebraska legislature passed the School Readiness Tax Credit Act, which creates two new tax credits in 2017 to support early childhood programs and the early childhood workforce. These new tax credits were modeled directly after the Louisiana School Readiness Tax Credits, which you will hear about in full next. So the first credit here in Nebraska is a credit for the early childhood workforce. This is a refundable credit for early childhood professionals who are employed by a program participating in our state's QRAS, which is called Step Up to Quality. Eligible individuals must have worked in the program for at least six months of the taxable year, and they also must meet minimum educational qualifications of a child development associate credential or a one-year certificate or diploma in early childhood education or child development. There are four levels of classification for the credit, ranging from a $500 credit to a $1,500 credit, based upon professional qualifications that are to be defined by our Nebraska Department of Education. To be noted here is the fact that this credit is not based upon the actual quality rating of the program, but rather on the individual's own professional qualifications. The second new credit here is a credit for early childhood programs. This credit is a non-refundable credit for programs that have achieved a minimum of a Step 3 rating in our Step Up to Quality program and that also serve children through the Child Care Subsidy Program. This credit is based upon the average monthly number of children served through the Child Care Subsidy multiplied by an amount based on the program's Step Up to Quality rating. The amounts per eligible child served range from $250 to $750. So for example, an eligible program rated at a step four that serves an average of 20 children per month through the subsidy in a taxable year would then receive $500 per eligible child 
for a maximum tax credit of $10,000. On this next slide, you can see the Nebraska fiscal impact estimates from our bill um, in 2016. And we'll get into the work behind these numbers a little later, but as we worked with our fiscal analysts, revenue committee members, and our good friends and colleagues at the Nebraska Department of Education who manage Step Up to Quality, our goal here was to keep the overall projected fiscal impact under $3 million, which we did. So in the bill as passed, though, so there is a $5 million cap on the credits for the next five years. Hi, this is Louise Stoney, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Louisiana School Readiness Tax Credits. Um, this question is about revenue generation. So I just want to be really clear at the outset that the Louisiana approach is quite different from the two previous approaches that you just heard about, in that these are uncapped credits. So the amount of monies that you see at the top of this are what was claimed in 2014. But the actual amount of these credits depends totally on who claims it and how many people. So there's, it's, there's not a cap. Unlike um, Nebraska, which actually put a cap and said they can't exceed more than $5 million, that cap doesn't exist in, in Louisiana. Um, so what these numbers show you is what's been generated so far. And I want to talk to you a little bit about, as I explain them, how this relates. So if you look in the first column where it says the child care expense family credit, this is a credit that's diff the Nebraska package didn't include this credit. This is a credit for families, um, and it's built on top of the dependent care tax credit, the federal DCTC. It's also a refundable credit. And basically, families, based on the star rate, quality rating of the program, would get between 50% and 200% more um, of the credit. I mean, again, this is not a huge amount. If you look at the average per, per, per participant, is only about $223. That's the average. You know, it's, it's more if you're lower income, less if you're fewer. But, but, um, but basically, that's how it works. Um, to give you a sense the, of growth in this, which is why I want you to think about the fact that these are uncapped credits, the first year that this was introduced in 2008, the claims on the parent child care expense credit were less than a million dollars. And now in 2014, it's up to about 3.2 million. So you see there's sort of what this does is to build in growth and growth based on as the number of programs that are in the STAR rating system grow, as parents become more uh, aware of this, it grows. But in the early years, the, um, the fiscals are, are lower. Um, now, a similar pattern, and I'm going to skip over providers for a minute, and let's talk about directors and staff in the middle. Um, a similar pattern you'll see in that credit. That credit uh, is similar to, you know, almost identical, actually, to the one that Nebraska described, um, except that it's not capped. Um, and I, I think actually another um, difference is that, is that in the um, Louisiana credit, there is a cost of living, an automatic cost of living built in. So if you look at the bottom box where it says features, we started out with levels that were similar to what Nebraska has, but now the levels range from about 1630 to about 3260 based on the educational level of the program. Um, I think what's, what's really interesting about the director and staff credit is how successful it's been and how much it's grown. To give you a sense, in 2008, total claims for this credit were about 1.5 million. Now it's more than five times as big, up to over 8 million. And that's because early care and education staff are participating in education and training in record numbers particularly huge increases in the number of staff getting their CDAs and their AAs. We're, for all intents and purposes, we're looking at like 400% increases in the number of staff that are actually participating in this. So what's cool about it is that it's actually a way for, to take a wage subsidy to scale by the tax system. Because if you get those credentials, and you work in a center, you will get the financial reward. There's not an issue of the money running out or, you know, you have to make a separate application. It's part of your tax claim. Now, I'm going to go back for a minute to the provider credit because the story is a little bit different there. So the provider credit is very similar to what Nebraska des described. It's a credit that's built on top of the state child care subsidy. 
the Louisiana levels, however, are much higher than Nebraska's. The, the level two of uh, the two stars is 750 up to 1500 for five stars, or um, so the levels are higher. But I think what's interesting in the provider credit is that we have not seen the consistent increase in sort of a straight line. So to give you some sense, in 2008, claims for the provider credit were about 1.6 million, and there were about 124 providers in. in. Um, now you see in 2014, it's 4 million and there's 405 providers. So yeah, that's significant growth. But here's what's interesting. If I showed you the numbers from 2012, two years ago, well actually more than two years ago, but because this is the most recent data we have, there were 659 providers claiming the credit for a total of 5.28 million. So it's gone down. Why has it gone down? Because the credit is linked to the child care subsidy system, and there are fewer child care subsidies available in Louisiana because CCDF dollars have shrunk. So quite frankly, if I were to do this all over again, I would pick a measure different than the child care subsidy system. I'd try to pick something like the free and adult uh, child care food program eligibility or something like that, free and reduced lunch. Um, so that you didn't have these fluctuations, because we have seen significant fluctuations in the provider um, uh, amount. Um, the last two columns, the business uh, support credit and the resource and referral. The business support credit is pretty standard credit. Many of you have these in your states. It's a credit for businesses that invest um, in their employees, chunk it for their employees. Um, we've, that's pretty flat. I mean, it goes up and down a little, but it's pretty standard. There haven't been significant differences in, in appropriations for that. Um, the resource and referral credit is a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit for contributions to an r and &R. That's been a really helpful resource for the r and That's actually gone up and down a lot, just depending on how much outreach the r and do. Um, but, you know, I think it's pretty, pretty standard. I mean, by and large, these are relatively low amounts of money compared to the other credits. So that's basically a quick overview and also a sense of, of money that's generated. Thank you, Louise. So we've had an overview now of each of our financing strategies, and we're going to hear from our speakers about who had to be convinced in order to move the strategy from concept to reality. You'll hear as you listen to Philadelphia, then Nebraska, and then Louisiana, that expanding financing involves firm commitments from elected officials, both on the executive branch side and the legislative branch side. Let's get started with Philadelphia. Thank you. So in Philadelphia, uh, this initiative was an initiative of Mayor Jim Kenney, and this was his first year in office and one of his key signature initiatives. In order to get this done, uh, we require the vote of 17 council members. Uh, well, we have 17 council members, and we needed a majority of them to uh, vote for the Philadelphia beverage tax. And um, two prior efforts to pass the beverage tax had failed under the prior mayor, and both of those efforts had been focused on, you know, the health. Uh, benefits and the problems with consumption of sweetened benefits of sweetened beverages. However, this time the messaging was really changed to be about where the money would go for the pre-K, the community schools, the parks, rec centers, and the libraries. And so that's really where we had to get this done in our city council. And uh, Mary's going to tell you a little bit about what we still need to get done. So we were all very happy mid-June when City Council passed the tax, and no sooner was the tax passed when the beverage industry filed a lawsuit against the city claiming that this was an unlawful tax. And um, we sort of sweated over the summer and into through the fall as we were building our pre-K program in the city um, that uh, that we had this lawsuit looming over our heads. Um, in December, uh, the judge who was hearing the case here in Philadelphia uh, threw the lawsuit out and said no, this is a legal tax, it's very good, uh, move forward. Well, that wasn't um, exactly what the uh, beverage industry wanted to hear, 
So they filed an appeal to a higher court, and that's being considered right now. Um, we're also working to appeal to the highest court to see if we can get a ruling to sort of expedite the, the final decision-making about this because it could go on for years if we go up through the courts on this. And um, we are hopeful that the courts will uh, consider reviewing our case and that we will have an answer sometime this spring. But we're moving forward in spite of the fact that we have these appeals from the beverage industry because they didn't like the fact that this large city was able to uh, implement the sweet beverage tax. So in Nebraska, to begin, we first had to convince our introducing senator, uh, Heath Mello, to take on the introduction of this proposal. Thankfully, we had a very good relationship with him, and he had the breadth of experience, knowledge, and interest in our early childhood programs in Nebraska to take this on with really with great skill and precision. He um, should be credited, I think, because he really took the time to listen, study, and fully understand the Louisiana School Readiness Tax Credits and the important interplay they create between the QRIS, the child care subsidy, pro and, the su and, and the child care subsidy program. Um, he was also instrumental in, our, in the past in the passage of our QRIS, QRIS legislation in 2013. So he could speak eloquently to both programs and the importance of this funding intersection for quality. Finally, it didn't hurt anything that um, it meant, in fact, it meant everything, that he was not only a known early childhood champion, but also that he was the chair of our appropriations committee, and this was during his final year before he faced term limits. So he originally introduced this bill for us thinking it would be um, beneficial to have a conversation focused on quality and workforce compensation, not thinking that we would be successful. But in the end, he made this his personal priority bill. Every Nebraska senator gets one. He made this his out of roughly 800 or some bills. So this was also incredibly meaningful. We also had to convince our revenue committee members, who are no strangers to tax credits. They had heard a prior attempt the year before um, at an early childhood workforce uh, tax credit that we brought that was different than this effort, but they were somewhat familiar with workforce compensation issues and the importance of um, tying this tax credit to quality and compensation. So after working closely with them and making many concessions for a pathway forward, they advanced the bill uh, unanimously from committee. And then finally, it was on to the full legislature. And this is where I would pause and ask you to remember that Nebraska is the only unicameral in the nation, so we only have one house and 49 state senators who work very closely together to do their jobs. So based on their trust of the work of the introducing senator, the revenue committee, and all of the advocates and others who are working on this proposal, the bill was ultimately passed 42 to 5 and then signed by our governor. Okay, Louisiana. Um, actually, before I go to this slide, I just noticed there was a question from Debbie Moore in the chat box asking if family child care providers participate in the Louisiana credit. And I want to say the answer is that family child care is not licensed in Louisiana. And so by definition, they can't participate in the quality rating system or the new uh, accountability system. Um, however, when we drafted the school readiness tax credits, we drafted it in such a way that if and when Louisiana ever regulates family child care, they would automatically be included. So the definitions in the law don't exclude them. What excludes them is that right now Louisiana doesn't license them. All right, so let's talk about who had to be convinced in Louisiana. So when this legislation was first passed, it was introduced by Governor Blanco, and she actually, it was in her executive budget, but interestingly enough, it was framed as economic development. 
So it was in the economic development of her executive budget, framed as support for small businesses. It wasn't in the education budget. It wasn't in the social service budget. It was in the economic development budget. So that's huge because it meant that we weren't competing with those other budgets, um, or at least not directly. The uh, Senator Duplessis, who led the charge in the legislature, was an African-American banker from New Orleans. So she really understood the role that tax credits play in finance, and she understood finance. So her background wasn't early childhood. It was finance. Um, we had some interesting and unexpected allies in the legislative fiscal offices. Um, you know, it was, it, I have to say that when Jeff Nagel, who, who led this charge at the time in Louisiana, invited me to come down to help him sort of walk through and talk to folks on this bill, I really expected that they were going to just, you know, that the fiscal people were going to give us a hard time. And much to my surprise, they didn't, because these are young people. Many of them had children. They had been working on tax credit credits for the oil and gas industry and for other businesses that from – and here was something for kids that could benefit them, that could benefit their friends. I mean, they totally got it, and so they became great allies. And that was a really interesting lesson for us in terms of getting these inside allies. Um, there was also very broad support among advocates, but quite frankly, the early childhood advocates were the toughest sell because they really didn't understand the power of tax credits, and quite frankly, it took a while to bring them around, and honestly, it wasn't until the credit really took effect and providers started understanding what it meant that we had a, such strong support in the early childhood community. Um, so that's when it first passed. But then I think what, what shortly after, um, there was a new governor, uh, uh, Bobby Jindal, in L Louisiana, which changed everything. Absolutely everything has changed in Louisiana since this was introduced. I mean, child care got shifted from social services over to the Department of Education. There was a whole new accountability system. They phased out the QRIS. They now have a new account way of doing accountability. They have a new way of thinking about professional development. Soup to nuts. But what's astonishing is that the school readiness tax credits have survived all of that and still have strong support. So I think that, that and, and so getting the Department of Ed to really understand the power of the tax credits was, was key, and they really did getting the, the other thing that's important is that with term limits, you're constantly having to educate the legislature. So the, the, the person who's leading this charge in Louisiana now, Melanie Bronfren, unfortunately couldn't be on this call, but hats off to Melanie. She's just a relentless, relentless advocate who is constantly out there talking about these things to, to everyone. But getting the legislature on board has been, has been key as well. Even though they don't, they're in law, they'd have to, quote, repeal them, there's always efforts for some new person to come in and want to say, oh, let's get rid of all tax credits, and, and, and we, this, these credits get swooped up into the thing. So Melanie has to do the hard work of kind of getting it unhinged and educating them again. Thank you, Louise. So now we've heard a little bit about who had to be convinced and some of the process issues in the states, as well as some of the winning arguments that our colleagues used. It's time for us to hear a little bit more about the advocacy strategy. And sticking with our order, we're going to turn things over to Philadelphia. Thank you. Uh, first, I do want to uh, address a question from Doug Osborne about whether or not Philadelphia is actually collecting this tax despite the pending appeal. And the answer is yes. Uh, the tax became effective on January 1st. Our first tax returns are due on February 20th. Um, and so talking about our advocacy strategy, though, to get this done in Philadelphia, uh, really we had to have a very strong advocacy strategy because we had a very well-organized, well-funded um, uh, set of folks opposing the passage of the Philadelphia beverage tax. So the beverage industry mounted a $10 million campaign to defeat the tax. Uh, and that included lobbying elected officials, those 17 council members whose votes were needed for the tax, um, as well as a very public-facing advertising campaign. Um, you saw it on the radio, you saw it on billboards, you saw it on every single soda delivery truck that rolled through our city, um, trying to convince uh, everyday taxpayers and Philadelphia residents that this would be bad for them um, and in the hopes that those residents would turn around and put pressure on their elected officials. And so we were really, they were really focused on the 
economic impacts and potential for job loss as a result of this tax as opposed to what it would be funded towards. And Mary can tell you a bit about what we did to uh, address that $10 million campaign. So we spent $2 million, um, you know, sort of David and Goliath here, um, and we got most of that money from foundation support or contributions from independent people who were uh, champions of uh, the, the, both the health benefits and the educational and uh, parks and rec uh, benefits for our city's citizens. So we formed an advocacy organization, Philadelphia for a Fair Future, and it was a very powerful, highly well-organized uh, effort with a number of key advocates from different sectors. We had a lot of educational advocates who could speak to the important value of quality pre-K. We had uh, a great group of people organized in, in the parks and rec arena, and um, we had the health department as well as uh, the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, and those groups participating uh, because they understood the value of the health benefits. So we all work together for the common purpose of making sure that this tax uh, got passed. And we had council hearings after council hearings after council hearings with hundreds of people testifying to the benefit of early childhood in particular. That was the most compelling of the three uh, advocacy uh, elements of this campaign. So like I mentioned before, our introducing senator was key, and I, I'm not sure I can stress that enough because he was able to navigate this um, new proposal through from start to finish in a what we consider a short session, which is just a short amount of working time. Um, for the full legislature to to be to have a proposal introduced and passed in one year. Also invaluable were our national partners, uh, so we could actually bring our senator a great bill for introduction. And this included, and I'm going to name names here, because um, this would not have been possible without them, and Melanie Bronson, who Louise just mentioned, Louise Stoney herself, um, who I'm we're very grateful to, and Jeff Nagel, who Louise also mentioned, um, these three, they uh, can't say enough um, about the time they spent on the phone guiding us. Dr. Nagel even traveled to Nebraska to testify at our public hearing in front of the legislature, and he met with um, one of our largest newspapers' editorial boards to talk about the tax credits and their impact in Louisiana. These three provided such rich information. They helped us think through the fiscal pieces and guided us with messaging. Um, we really heeded their advice and wisdom and followed their instructions to apply what worked well in Louisiana to what we saw or hoped or knew would work in Nebraska. So part of this messaging um, revolved around childcare as an industry um, and an economic driver with information from the Committee for Economic Development. Um, similar to what Louise was talking about, pushing this as an economic issue. They, at the Committee for Economic Development, they have state-by-state -state examples that make the business case for investing in high-quality care that I think we as a community need to take full advantage of. For example, in Nebraska, we were, we were able to state that industry revenue combined with spillover effects have a nearly $460 million impact on the economy. And this is huge. This is a really a new way to leverage the importance and the power of the childcare industry. Um, we also worked with our valuable local and state partners and advocates in the field here in Nebraska, the Nebraska AEYC, the Buffett Early Childhood Institute, and First Five Nebraska, as well as the unusual suspects like members of the business community. Of critical importance in our, in our advocacy strategy was going in with plans A, B, C, D, and E, um, ready to make concessions, which we did, which we had to, to get it out of the Revenue Committee. 
Um, first of all, as when the bill was introduced, we had four credits modeled after Louisiana in our original proposal. Um, we decided to drop two of those credits and we went with what we thought were most impactful in Louisiana and kept the program and the staff credits. We had to make the program credit non-refundable, which is very unfortunate. We hope to go back and change that someday in the future. We lowered our credit limits to, to meet with the requested fiscal note. We agreed to the cap and we got the fiscal note under the $3 million. One final piece of um, advocacy strategy that was important is that we mapped out the impact by legislative districts showing each state senator that, senator that this bill had the potential to impact their personal district because, as it turned out, every legislative district had at least one program participating in our QIS. Okay, so Louisiana is in somewhat of a different position because it's had a credit for a while. And so the real issue is, you know, eight years down the road, how do you keep this momentum up? Um, so I, so um, one of the first things that is documenting success, and, you know, Melanie is constantly working on this. You see a screenshot of a report that I co-authored um, with her office that really we're, you know, basically showing the legislature this has been incredibly successful. Um, really pointing to the results that they're getting for kids, for child care businesses, for professionalization of the workforce, all those sorts of things. Um, internally, a lot of work to remind policymakers that the tax credits leverages federal money. So Louisiana does use money from the tax credits as federal match. So helping the legislature to really understand that um, has been important. Um, you know, again, this messaging issue, I think that, that uh, one of the good things is that it's really hard to uh, repeal or get rid of a tax credit and that once you get it going, it, it sort of has a built-in life of its own. On the other hand, you still always have these efforts. And so underscoring that messaging, but also putting a human face on it. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite stories is that, is that there was um, this past year a hearing um, to, um, from the tax committee to try to repeal a whole bunch of tax credits. And you can probably imagine what a hearing on tax law looks like. You know, it's a bunch of men in a room and a bunch of accountants droning on, reading numbers off pages. I mean, it can be deadly boring. And then they get to the school readiness tax credits, and all of a sudden the room lights up, and it fills up with African-American women singing songs, handing out pictures of kids telling incredible stories about staff members that were able to go back to school and buy their first home. And I mean, these legislators just, they didn't know what hit them. So it's really interesting to sort of think about a new audience that you're dealing with and then how you might address that audience in ways that aren't um, atypical. But keeping that momentum up has been really key. Um, I think the last thing, too, which isn't on this slide, but I want to take a page from what Sarah Ann just said, which is also true in Louisiana, and that is um, Melanie's also able to get data on participation by, by parish, which is the legislative districts in Louisiana. And so she's able to show a legislator, this is how many teachers are benefiting and directors in your district. This is how many schools. This is how many families. This is how many businesses. This is so those are really powerful numbers because legislators really want to know how it's impacting their um, constituency. And those are some of the kinds of data, again, when you have these allies inside government, when you're beginning to think about how to build this case, that you can begin to keep track. That's great. Thank you, Louise. And that was especially helpful there to end with someone who's into this work a little longer as a reminder about the kind of sustaining work that you have to do and the need to keep at it. So our next question really focuses on something that we found in organizing today's webinar interesting about all three of these strategies, which is they're all well connected to the state's QRIS. So we've asked them each to respond to this question, which is to understand a little bit more about why they've connected their uh, strategy to the QRIS. I'm going to turn things over to Philadelphia to get us started. Great. Thanks, Harriet. So um, Philadelphia is the largest or the poorest large city in the country with um, 
less than half of the Philadelphia uh, kindergarten children arrive ready to learn and thrive in school. Um, many children arrive years behind their peers. So this is sort of a, a cause and an effect of the poverty here, the deep poverty here in Philadelphia. And um, as much as an educational strategy, I, the crafters of the um, design for the Philadelphia pre-K are looking to um, getting to the root of some of the causes of poverty in the city and investing local funds into quality pre-K opportunities over the next five years. So we're working very carefully to invest and coordinate and build greater capacity among um, the pre-Ks in the city and the child care centers and family providers. Um, we are requiring that everyone who is selected to be part of this process, the group that we have selected, the 90 different sites and 70 different providers, are part of the state's Keystone Stars. Um, we have two pools of uh, participants. One are the quality participants who are top star levels, three and four, and another provisional group who are not yet at star three and four, but are required to get to star three and four um, within 18 months. And we are resourcing those providers with extra uh, technical assistance and support so that they will, uh, one, have their rooms that we're funding or the classrooms that they're funding look like star threes and fours, and the whole provider uh, operation gets to star three uh, or four within the 18-month the period after being involved. So we're, we, uh, our intermediary facilitator is also one of the, the state um, uh, contracted organizations that works with, uh, work, implements the STARS program throughout the, the state in this particular region. So everything that we built for this program relates to our state's Keystone STARS program. So our connection to the QRIS in Nebraska here, our intent was really, this was another avenue for us to infuse money into our quality rating and improvement system. Um, we had created some incentives through increased child care subsidy rates and um, bonuses and some scholarship money, but this was another way to add to that and help ensure that if we're asking providers to do more, we're providing them with the resources to get there. Um, this was also an incentive for QRIS participation and higher quality in our programs. Like I mentioned earlier, our QRIS legislation was only passed in 2013, and our ratings go public this year. And so this was a way for us to incentivize participation in this new program. Our QRIS is not mandatory for all providers. It's mandatory based on um, the, num the dollars received through the child care subsidy program. So if, for instance, a program receives more than a quarter million dollars in child care subsidy, they are mandated to participate. Um, these tax credits, tax credits are really a way to provide a stable funding source if you can get them in place. Like Louise talked about, these, they're, just a, they're more protected. They feel a little bit different. They're an innovative way to get um, a stable funding source when a legislature is dealing with um, budgets going up and down and revenue fluctuations. Tax credits are also less vulnerable to political pressures. Um, it was another way for us to tie the dollars to quality. With limited resources, it was really important to target these dollars um, to make sure that they were being invested in quality and in ways that we can measure through our quality rating and improvement system. And finally, there's really this appetite for early childhood action. I feel like our legislators and others are becoming really informed and educated about the science and the research and the return on investment, and they want to be, the next step is, so what do I do with that? 
Um, and here with these tax credits, we were able to give them a proposal and make it local. This was, this was an infusion of money into Nebraska small businesses to support Nebraska families and Nebraska children and Nebraska jobs. And much like an earned income tax credit, these dollars were going to go right back into Nebraska communities to help um, drive economic development. And so that was a really um, important piece for us as well. So Louisiana. Um, I think there's been big changes in Louisiana in terms of this, this slide. Um, when, when the tax credits were first created, they were very intentionally designed to be linked to the quality rating and improvement system and designed to both provide incentives for participating and incentives for moving, moving up. Um, and and we there were definitely lots of positive results in that vein. But I think a big change happened with the Jindal administration. And, and um, the quality start, the QRIS, has been phased out. And this year is actually being officially replaced with a new accountability system. Um, so it was really essential to think about what, you know, to ensure that the score and tax credits remain in effect and were linked. And so um, basically it looks like that, we're, that that's going to be able to be done through administrative rule. There was a lot of concern about reopening the legislation, the political risk of that. And it, it appears that by changing the definitions of the terms rather than reopening the law that we can do this. And so in other words, redefining what is, so taking the accountability system and lining up it up with the steps and saying this is equivalent to, this is equivalent to, this is equivalent to, um, is essentially where we're going. And the same thing with the professional development work. Um, so I think the important takeaway here is that despite all the changes, the, the SRT, the school readiness tax credits have remained essentially intact and untouched. That's huge. And they've remained intentionally linked to quality and that there's been a continued commitment and a deeper understanding over time among the folks inside government that are working on this about how to um, ensure that they are they continue to stay alive and that we continue to think strategically about how to use them as an incentive for quality so it's a bit different it's not as direct as in the other two states but the, the fascinating thing is that it's got legs and it's got legs that are in for the long haul Thank you, Louise. So it's one thing, as we've said, to kind of devise and design the strategy. Getting everything implemented is a whole other level of work. So we're asking each of our communities to talk a little bit about program implementation. And as you listen, um, keep in mind that they're in very different phases of the implementation cycle with Philadelphia and Nebraska pretty early and Louisiana a little bit later in the cycle. Great, thanks, Harriet. Um, I, I want to say that, uh, or repeat what um, Marissa said. We just started collecting the tax um, a few weeks ago. So that part of the program implementation is very young. Um, our actual program implementation, uh, the tax implementation, started back in um, May of 2015 with the city voting on uh, establishing a universal pre-K commission, which uh, concluded their recommendations last spring in April, uh, spring of 2016, and that sort of laid some of the groundwork for what we are doing here in Philadelphia. Um, we can't get to universal pre-K. Right now, there are about 40,000 three- and four-year-olds. About 32,000 of them are in early childhood programs. Um, about 15,000 of those 32 are in quality uh, pre-K, and the 17 or so others are in either not in pre-K or in poor quality programs, so that we're trying to shift and get to universal pre-K over several years. And so in this year, we're creating the necessary infrastructure for expansion. We're enrolling 2,000 kids. Um, we're, we're approaching our target as we speak. That's really what obsesses my time all day. 
um, and we'll enroll an additional 1,000 in September. The other thing that we have to do, which is importantly linked to quality, is that we have to in increase the number of um, credentialed professionals who are teaching in our uh, quality pre-K providers. And so one dimension of our work is really working to provide professional development and educational supports to 100 lead and assisted teachers to build the number and quality of the uh, early childhood workforce. Um, I can't flip the next slide, but if uh, Harriet, if you could, oops, one back. Sorry, yeah. Chris, so, I did it the same as Mary. <laughs> that's okay. Um, and again, you see in 18, another, it's sort of like the little chart that we had in the beginning, another 1,000 children in quality pro providers and professional development for 50 lead and assistant teachers and 19 similar strategy, another 1,000 in pre-K slots. Getting to the point where we've tipped the balance so that we don't have the, the majority of the kids in the city, the, the three and four year olds, are getting the support that they need to be successful when they enter kindergarten. And we're going to be doing an evaluation that will help us with our process and our outcomes to determine if, in fact, our strategies are working and the curriculum and the activities that we are um, planning in our quality programs are having the, the uh, desired outcomes and expecting that we'll see good improvement in our overall educational system here in the city. So implementation in Nebraska is happening as we speak. This will be the first, the bill was only passed, introduced and passed last year, so this will be the first taxable year that we would have eligible recipients for this tax credit. So what we're doing now is spreading the word, um, sending out mailers to providers who are participating in QIS, um, writing articles for newsletters, taking advantage of social media, just trying to get the word out. Um, we're also ironing out the details whenever policy is introduced, there are always implementation details. Um, so far, so good. Uh, we'll stay tuned. And then um, finally, I wrote holding on because Nebraska is facing a serious budget hole right now. And I'm, we're not sure if this will be a case of last tax credit in, first tax credit out or not, today is actually the last day of bill introduction for this new Nebraska legislative session. So um, after this phone call, I will be <laughs> looking through bills to see if anyone um, introduced anything to repeal this tax credit. So we are definitely holding on at this point. Harriet, I think we need you to move the next slide. I did. Okay. Very good, Louisiana. So um, one of the things I just want to say quickly in response, in sort of the, the segue between Nebraska and Louisiana is to say that I was listening to Nebraska and remembering the early years of implementation in Louisiana. And I think there's a really golden space where the providers actually feel this happening, that you start to feel a change. So I remember actually being in Louisiana and doing work and talking to providers about it, and they were kind of like, well, I filed my taxes, but I haven't gotten the money back. Like they didn't quite believe it was going to happen. Or, you know, and, and for some of them, it was like even the thought that they would file a tax return because some of them hadn't, you know. So it's really an interesting relationship that goes on. And then when the money started to flow and they actually realized, oh, my God, this is, I'm actually going to get this. This is a check. It comes. They be, you get, begin to build this level of buy-in that somehow or another conceptually they can't grasp until they actually experience it. So I suspect, um, Sarah Ann, that you'll, you'll be in a different place, you know, a year or two from now. Um, so I think the success in Louisiana, I mean, th there's no question, this has made a big difference in, particularly in childcare teachers, it is so interesting to go to Louisiana and talk to the folks that are providing the professional development and the technical assistance, and they'll say to you, 
I sit down with the teachers and I look them in the eye and say, if you go for a CDA, do you know you're going to get $750 back in your taxes every year, and every year that amount will go up as long as you keep working in the field? Like, there's this direct connection between a result. that, And so what you find is that over time, your folks that are just doing the work out there are selling the tax credit. They're getting the provider buy-in because for them it extends the provider's interest in wanting to do the professional development, wanting to do the work on the career ladders and such. Um, I think the other thing that's been good is that, by and large, implementation has been pretty simple and straightforward, building on existing systems. So verification is through the existing registry. It's through the existing um, systems that track QRIS, the existing systems that track subsidies. So there was not this big need to create some new entity or some new division or some. It was, you know, it, it's fairly straightforward. Um, so I think that, that, by and large, it's been very successful and they've seen results. Um, so there are some, some, have been some challenges in implementation. I mentioned one of them previously, which is the value of the provider credit has decreased because it's linked to subsidy receipt. And so that's definitely a challenge and one that's very politically difficult to change. Um, um, but certainly if we had to do it all over again, um, I would like to change that. Um, I think another thing, another challenge that would be very different from a new uh, state going into this, when we did this tax credit, it was before the cost modeling um, methodology that we have now. And so we really didn't have any way of being able to estimate what should the value be at the different star levels when we set the value of the refundable credit. And literally, Jeff Nagel and I made it up. Um, and we just took a guess, we, you know, a stab in the dark. And, and now, at, subsequently to that, you know, several years later, after the, the cost modeling t um, methodology was available, we ran cost models. And we saw where we were wrong. And basically what we've done, what we did was to, the, credit, the, the, the amounts were too large for the lower stars and not big enough for the higher stars. So not surprisingly, there is a financial incentive for centers to remain at two stars. And, and this is kind of an interesting, I get into these interesting discussions with people because the tax credits are by design based on, uh, on, on outputs. In other words, when you attain a star, then you get the money. Um, and pe folks say, but wait a minute, why don't you give the money, the money to get there? Well, the interesting thing is essentially that's what we did. Uh, you know, that's what the credits were doing. They were giving them more money at the lower star levels, but that didn't make them use that money to get to higher stars because financially they were better off if they didn't go. They were financially better if they just sat at star two. So I think that that's been a challenge and one that, that we're certainly wrestling with as, as the um, state thinks about, about the credits going forward. Um, and then finally, as I said, it's not over just because you pass a credit. Thank you, Louise. So one of the good things about um, doing something that's innovative and different is that you get to learn new things to get the work done. So our next question for each of our speakers is, what did you have to learn to undertake this work? And we'll hear from Philadelphia first. Thank you. So as we've talked about a bit, Philadelphia was the first large city in the United States to implement a beverage tax, which meant we had a lot to learn. Um, the city of Berkeley did, in fact, do it before us, but just to give you a sense of scale, uh, what Berkeley collects in a year from this tax is what in Philadelphia we think it'll take about five or six days to collect. Uh, so it's very different. So there was a ton to learn. The, the first thing we did learn, though, was that changing the messaging on why we were implementing a beverage tax um, was really the most critical in terms of getting this done. Um, by switching from the focus on the health benefits of a beverage tax to instead the community benefits associated with everything we'd be able to fund from the revenues really was something important that we learned uh, this time around on our third try. Uh, we also had to uh, learn a ton simply about how to implement this tax. Uh, you know, Berkeley had already sort of paved the way a bit, but um, simply because of the differences of scale, we found there were still lots of 
unanswered questions in terms of how to handle all the logistics, how to figure out which products are taxable and which are not. Um, and we had very little to go on in terms of how this has been done elsewhere. Uh, subsequent to Philadelphia passing this in June, uh, in, by November, a number of other cities had uh, hopped on, mainly through referendums, so San Francisco, Oakland, the city of Boulder, uh, as well as Cook County, where Chicago is, um, are on their way to having a beverage tax as well. So now we're beginning to put together a crew of folks who are talking through these issues and putting together monthly calls. but. In the beginning, there's just a lot of questions that uh, we needed to answer that if other folks are considering this, we're now sort of happy to share what we've learned. Uh, and then the last thing that we learned was that you really do need to plan for the media scrutiny. We invested um, a lot in our outreach and communications, uh, both directly to the affected taxpayers, but also to the general public and to the press. There, because you're doing something new, um, there's going to be a lot of attention, a lot of questions, and that if you don't plan to make time to do that or plan to have materials available to walk folks through it or ways to um, explain what's going on, you're not going to be very successful in getting this done. So we've done everything from webinars like this one to we've got street teams that are multilingual out up and down the commercial corridors across our city, um, just going into stores and letting them know both how the tax works and also providing uh, information about what the funding is going towards. So in Philadelphia, you may soon see uh, on the soda cooler in your corner store decal talking about pre-K uh, and why the beverage tax is important. So those are some of the things we've learned about implementing the tax itself. And Mary will tell you a bit about implementing the pre-K. Yeah, well, there's a lot. And check with me in a couple of weeks. I'm sure there will be even more. But um, first, um, I would say don't assume people understand the value of investments in quality pre-K. For those of us who live this, it, it's obvious. You know, and the rate of the return on this investment is terrific. But but um, it, it does mean that you have to do a lot of education um, for people and explain to them why this is important for the city. Um, it, it, we have a gradual investment to, to, that's required to get to universal pre-K, which is our ultimate goal. And so as we get there, there are equity questions um, around who gets to participate in uh, pre-K. Right now, any child that's three or four years old um, within the prescribed time period and who is a resident of the city is eligible to participate in um, pre-K, quality pre-K, at no cost to them for school year, school day. So we're investing $8,500 per child per year, and there are no um, uh, income thresholds or other restrictions. It's just the age and the residency requirements. So there's some some questions about equity and, and just generally how you implement this gradually when so many people are interested in getting it. And again, as Marissa said, we have had a lot of media scrutiny and reporters are constantly trying to blow holes in all of this. Um, now there's a lot of, uh, the, when the fa tax finally started getting collected, there was a large cry from people who evidently didn't know that this was coming. And so then, you know, there, there's, uh, an interest in sort of dissecting the whole project to see if it's really worth the investment that people are making in the program. So we are very careful about our relationship with the media and making sure that we're uh, giving good information and accurate information and uh, positive information about the program. Next slide. Oh, so we, you want to go back to um, Nebraska. That's Louisiana. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So we're fortunate here where I work. We're a legislative advocacy group, and we have regular experience with tax credits. We find ourselves working regularly on 
on the earned income tax credit and the child care independent tax credit. So that um, there wasn't much of a learning curve there. We just wanted to take advantage of such important policies for families. We did utilize we did um, utilize the National Women's Law Center work, their important research and evaluation work on Louisiana's school readiness tax credits, um, and we also utilized anything our national partners sent us. Um, that Louise sent us, that Melanie sent us from Louisiana. She sent me file after file um, of everything they had done, which was extraordinarily helpful. And why? And all of this is why I think today is so important, so that we can all learn from one another. And finally, we work closely here at the local level, level with our state partners and colleagues to make sure that the details were right for our programs and for our providers. Um, as far as where do we set the beginning uh, qualifications for the credits and the levels for qualifications and the professional um, development minimum requirements. And so those were important um, approaches to learning aside from the tax credit piece um, in Nebraska. So now, Louisiana. Um, I think one of the things that's really been key for us is the whole issue of how do you estimate uptake rates? likely uptake rates. Because I think what's different about a tax credit is that when you're doing your fiscal notes for your ways and means people, it's real easy to have very high fiscal notes and to assume, oh, everybody that's eligible is going to get, going to claim this. And, and the reality is that's not really true. So the questions that you really want to think about are, how many providers and practitioners are likely to actually reach higher quality? Okay, we have some trend data that can probably give us some good indicators for assumptions. But then how many of those are actually likely to claim the credits? And so one of the things that we've been doing in Louisiana now, because we've got to, even, even though we think we can do this without having to reopen the legislation, we're going to have to go back to the fiscal committees. And so we're looking at the fiscal going forward. Um, and, and so what we're trying to do is to go back into the data and take a look at so of the providers and practitioners that were technically eligible, how many of them claimed to so see if we can adjust our uptakes. Um, so I think a lot of this information, again, another the last bullet about consumer behavior, when you're thinking about a parent credit, you know, you're really thinking about, so how many parents, A, what kind of choices are they going to make be making based on this? Will they actually use a provider that's eligible for the credit? Will they actually claim the credit? You know, these are all big what ifs and they have profound impacts on what your fiscal is, and you want your fiscal note to be as low as possible so that you can get it through the Ways and Means Committees, but you also don't want to be in trouble where you've actually sold a bill of goods that then it ultimately costs them a lot more. So this is really tricky, and I think we're learning more, but there's just a lot more to know. And then the last one about cost modeling I already talked about, so we don't need to go into that. Thank you, Louise. So that's interesting just to hear from our um, speakers about the kind of different learning they had to do and some of the challenges in their learning um, to put this forward. But we have two more questions uh, that we are asking our speakers, and then we hope we might have a few minutes for you to ask other questions. So if you do have other questions, now is a good time to put them into the chat box. But our first question for everyone is a broad-based open one for each of them. What do you want to share with the group about your successes so far? Great. Well, thank you. So we really, we've got a quote in there from Daniel Burnham, um, which is, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized, which is a much more eloquent way to say, go big or go home. Um, and that's really what Philadelphia's success with this was. Um, for us, getting this tax passed was uh, pretty huge and being able to start to generate $91 million in revenue a year for the various programs we wanted to support. So for us, um, it, the sense is, is that getting a tax like this passed um, or doing this kind of work is really hard regardless of whether you're going to be raising $9 million or $91 million. Um, and so if you're going to put all that effort in, uh, you may as well go for the big thing. So that, I, as I would say, on the tax side is particularly one of our great successes so far. Mary, do you want to touch base on the um, pre-K side? And Yes, yeah. So we have nearly 2,000 kids enrolled in quality pre-K seats. Um, we 
kicked off the program in October and uh, have been furiously uh, enrolling kids in, in programs all around the city. It was a sort of an elaborate selection process for the providers, and once that was done, we were able to open up the enrollment process. Um, yeah, things happen quick, can happen quickly. You know, we went from uh, a concept a year ago to full implementation on a um, multi-year implementation. So, yeah, it happened quickly, and it's big. So timing is everything. Timing and utilizing it has really been a great success here. We, heard, we learned about these tax credits um, years ago during a National Women's Law Center presentation, but following the recession um, wasn't the best time to introduce this type of policy. So we waited and we prepared um, and we studied these tax credits and watched what was happening. Also a great success. I love that you, uh, Louise talked about this golden space because as we talk to providers about these tax credits, um, they light up. There's this recognition and pride of the important work that they're doing and this excitement about um, extra income um, and feeling valued. So that's just been um, really phenomenal to watch so far. And finally, this is really just one more building block for us here in Nebraska and our you know, constant and movement to create an early childhood system of care. So this slide, the reason I'm sharing you this slide is because it wasn't created by me. It was created by, the Louis by Jenna Conway in the Louisiana Department of Education. I've actually talked about each one of these things, but what's great is that this is how she describes what's important about the tax credit. Um, and so I, you know, I think that I think that really getting your your key leaders to understand the value of this and to be your allies in keeping it going is really huge. And I think probably the one thing, the only one of these five things that I actually really haven't talked about it much in this presentation is number four, which is really I think it's so interesting that there are unusual partners out there. And for example, accountants and tax preparers, they're going to spread the word about tax credits. And so I just think it's an interesting thing that, um, that there are different ways to get the word out and that we've got this whole world of, for outside of our very traditional early care and education allies that can be key players for us. And I think when you start to get in the tax credit world, you start reaching them. Okay, so that was a little bit about successes. This is our actual last question, um, and that question is also an important one. And people have, I think, shared a lot with us as we've been through today's discussion about things that have worked well and things that are challenges to them. But we're going to focus in here for our closing question on what those challenges are and how it is people are really trying to address them. And then, as I said, if people have other questions, I think we are doing pretty well on time. So um, please put any other questions you want speakers to answer into the chat box. Mary and Marissa, it's all yours. Yeah, so Philadelphia challenges, you've heard most of them through the presentation, but the timeline, as you've heard, was pretty aggressive, four to five months to get it passed, and that was a lot of work six months from passage to implement the tax and start the program, select the providers, enroll the children, 2,000 kids. Um, media scrutiny you heard about, the uh, skeptics who are, are trying to find the flaws in the whole design, the legal challenges and the cost associated with those legal challenges has been a real difficult challenge. And ongoing skepticism about the effective administration. There's, you know, the, the, there's this suspicion that government isn't capable of doing anything effectively, and um, that that happened that exists here in Philadelphia. So, as a the government, the mayor's office as the implementer, there's some skepticism skepticism about whether we have the capacity to deliver on this, and it's important that we demonstrate that, in fact, we do. So one of our greatest challenges um, in 
in this effort was the cost modeling that Louise talked about and really estimating our fiscal impact as fiscal analysts. Going into this, it was kind of a duh moment when, we, when it all happened and came, we came to realize it, but that our revenue fiscal analysts are really not experts on a quality rating and improvement system and what it actually takes for a program to move from, for instance, a step one to a step five. And so as they were doing their job, it was their job to assume that all eligible recipients would qualify for this credit. And so original estimates cost more than Louisiana's program after many years in, in effect. So we really worked closely with our partners at NDE, with Louise and others, to really bring down, to do what we could around cost modeling for a program, for a brand new QIS program, tax credits, um, and a reasonable uptake rate. Um, another challenge was also making concessions, giving up things that we really wanted, especially that non-refundable credit for programs. But um, with tough challenges come good challenges, and I think that will be within our evaluation and going back in five years to try to improve and build upon these credits um, if we can hold on to them going forward. So, Louisiana challenges. Um, I've mentioned many of the things along the way, so let me just say some new things that I haven't said before. Um, I want to end by underscoring that tax credits need to supplement but not supplant existing funding streams. Tax credits alone are not the answer. They're one part of an overall financing strategy. Um, so basically the credits in Louisiana have been really effective in boosting the quality but they cannot increase the number of children served, and there is a huge unmet need in Louisiana. So basically what Louisiana needs to do, it needs more direct subsidy dollars, or it needs in addition to this a soda tax like they did in Philadelphia to fund direct services. So tax credits isn't going to replace that sort of thing. Um, and that's a, that, so that's a, that's a really important thing. And I think there's been great support in Louisiana, terrific support for the tax credit strategy, lesser support for some of the direct subsidies. Um, but now I want to shift for a minute to a Louise Stoney challenge, since I have your ear. And that is, I've been pretty surprised that only a handful of states have tried to replicate this very effective financing strategy. And I find that perplexing. Um, I think it's really great that, Louis, that uh, Nebraska took this on and was successful. Kudos to them. But the Louisiana tax credits have been around for almost 10 years now, and we've only had one state replicating them. I just don't quite get it. This is a strategy to take wage subsidies to scale. Everyone is talking about how important compensation is. This strategy puts money directly in the pockets of early care and education teachers and directors in Louisiana and every single teacher and director who works in a, a quality program and has attained some one of the steps on their professional development system will get money. That is huge. But somehow or another, that isn't filtering through. Um, so I would really love to see much more talk about this among the advocacy community, particularly in this current political climate, given our new president-elect. I think there's a lot of, po of, of, of possibility here. And look, Louisiana, very conservative state. It was introduced by a Democratic governor shortly after that governor became a lame duck, quite frankly, when the, the year this was passed. And in came a very conservative Republican governor, and the tax credit survived and grew. So this is a very viable strategy. And I think we're very short-sighted not to be making it front and center something we be, we're talking about everywhere. Off my soapbox. Done. Thank you, Louise. So um, actually, Anne has just chimed in. Anne, I don't know how to unmute you. So I will just read your question to everyone. You probably have a perspective you'd like to share, but I'm just going to put out there what Anne said. And then, Louise, you probably want to respond. And Jonathan, if you can unmute Anne, she might want to say something too, Anne Mitchell. So Anne said, can't we incorporate the tax credits regarding quality and wage uh, supplementation into the federal dependent care tax credit? Louise, do you want to weigh in on that? And then, Jonathan, again, if you can unmute Anne, then she can speak for herself. Um, I think we absolutely could. I think it would be huge. I mean, the, the, 
it's one thing to do this in the states. We can also do it at the federal level. And I think if you think about what's going on nationally around this whole movement to professionalize the workforce, we can, it can, this, a national tax credit would feed right into this. So, you know, and let me pause for a minute and say something that, 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 that may be obvious, but in Louisiana, because the tax credits were linked to the Professional Development Registry, to the QRIS, to the subsidy system, it was really important to keep those systems in place. Very careful thought went in as changes happened to transitioning, so those systems didn't get lost and they continue. So there's this, there's this, this symbiotic relationship that can happen. We can begin to have some more national support for a national professionalization movement if we think about this as a strategy. And I think I hear Anne unmuting herself, so maybe you want to yes, chime in. Yes, she has. Anne, do you want to chime in now? Sure. I just think the uh, fact that tax credits are or tax reform, however you want to think about it, the federal level is going to happen. We have got to put this out there as a way to reform the child independent care tax credit and add some workforce supports to it and add quality to the parent side. And I think that has been talked about. But I'm really very surprised given how interested everyone seems to be in the quality of the early childhood workforce being a key component of quality for kids. So now we have some other ideas for people to pursue in terms of both your own state-based work and um, supportive work in terms of pub federal public policy and federal advocacy. Um, we, I want to thank actually each of our speakers, Mary and Marissa and Sarah and Louise, for taking the time to work so hard to prepare and, of course, all the work that you've done to basically get this work going in your communities and um, to uh, build a base of support and improve the knowledge base so that people could really get behind these strategies. As we're getting ready to close out, because I'm not seeing any other questions uh, from people on the phone, I just wanted to ask each of our speakers if you had any other final comments you wanted to offer um, before we um, shut down today's Let's Talk. So anything else from any of the four of you? This is Sarah Ann. I would just welcome any questions if after this, or um, I'd just like to pay it forward for all the support that we were given here in Nebraska to, to celebrate the success. Okay, so everyone heard that Sarah Ann is available for anyone who's very inspired by this to go start working on this in her home state to make sure that she's available to support you. Thank you, Sarah Ann. That's a great um, gift to the community as a whole. Anyone else have any last words you want to share, Louise or Mary or Marissa? This is Marissa. I would just say we're, we're happy to share everything we've learned about implementing a beverage tax. Um, it is really new. We know there's lots of folks thinking about it. So um, even if you haven't already been connecting this particular funding strategy to the work that you're doing with pre-K, um, if, you, if you want to start thinking about it or having those conversations, we're happy to talk with folks. Thank you, Marissa. And actually, one of the things I wanted to comment on is when we were preparing, and I asked Marissa if you know she had new learnings because she is a finance person to work on this beverage tax. She said plenty of them. You know that there was a lot there, um, even with her background and years of experience in municipal finance. So um, I hope people take that offer seriously for Marissa because there's a lot of technical details as well, and which you heard some of at the beginning just in the setup and the strategy about how would the um, city shape the tax proposal to give it the best shot of getting through all of this um, opposition that arose. And so this is Louise, and Louise. ditto, I'm happy to, you know, I've got documents, all the stuff that we did in Louisiana has been documented, and we're happy to, between me and Melanie, we can get it to you. Great. All right, so we have an open invitation um, from all of our speakers to really aid everyone. And so I think we are coming to the end of our last talk for the day. Um, there will be a recording available, as we've talked about, and um, other materials, basically, that will be made available to you. So again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time. People really stayed on the call, which we appreciate. And hopefully this got you some new information, new perspective, and new energy for your own work in tackling these important issues. So. In closing, I'm going to turn things over to Debbie for the last word. 
Well, I'd just like to say thank you all so much for such an informative and interesting conversation. And really, the amount of information you've put on the table is going to be a great help uh, to the whole field. Thank you again. Goodbye.